In recent decades, Somalia has become analogous to a failed state. It is known as a sanctuary for warlords, jihadists and even pirates. For this reason, the country poses a security risk in the Horn of Africa. However, it wasn't always like this. In fact, in mid-20th century, the country was a powerful force in the region. So in this report, we will explore the decline of Somalia, the origins of its long-standing crisis and what issues the country faces today. My name is Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. During the Middle Ages, several Somali states dominated the region, such as the Ajuran, Atal, Varsangali, Geladi, and the Mogadishu Sultanates. However, the situation changed dramatically in the 19th century when European powers colonized the Horn of Africa. As a result, British, French, and Italian colonies were established in the territories that were inhabited by ethnic Somalis. The circumstances changed again following the outcome of World War II. London needed to reward its East African allies and colonies for their support during the war. Therefore, artificial borders were designed in favor of the Allied forces. For instance, the Ogadan region, which was mostly inhabited by Somalis but conquered by the Ethiopians in the 19th century, was solidified as part of Ethiopia. At the same time, Italian Somaliland and British Somaliland were merged into the newly established Somali Republic in 1960. Meanwhile, French Somaliland remained with France but eventually parted ways and formed the Republic of Djibouti. As European powers redesigned the borders, large portions of Somalis were left outside of Somalia. In Mogadishu, the government sought to seize the territories inhabited by its kin, a goal that became known as Greater Somalia. Eventually, in the early 1960s, tensions culminated in a skirmish between Ethiopia and Somalia over the Ogadan Plateau. The Ethiopian Air Force overwhelmed the Somali army and won the fight. However, the clash would lead to future conflicts over the course of the Cold War. Then, suddenly, in 1969, President Sharmaki of Somalia was shot dead by his own bodyguards. The assassination was followed by a military coup in which Major General Barai seized power. Barai's military government changed the dynamic of the region. He threw out the constitution and dissolved the parliament. Thereby, the young democratic government changed to a one-party system. Over the next decade, Barre placed an emphasis on Islamic social principles of progress, equality and justice, which correlated with the communist doctrine. These developments enabled the military government to swiftly modernize the state and society by implementing large-scale social programs such as cooperative farms, factories, literacy programs and even tree planting campaigns. Barre's socialist emphasis received the approval of Egypt and the Soviet Union. As a result, financial and military aid from these two countries increased dramatically. For Moscow, extending support to socialist Somalia was a Cold War countermeasure against the pro-American government in Ethiopia. For Cairo, however, the decision to support Mogadishu was based on securing the resources of the Nile by destabilizing Ethiopia. Either way, every involved player was looking out for their own interests. Geopolitical tensions peaked in 1974 when Ethiopian Emperor Selassie was overthrown in a coup. A communist military council known as the Derg took control of the capital. However, the Derg quickly fell into an internal conflict over who would hold power. Distinct Derg factions as well as separatist movements rose up in arms. In the same year, a major drought hit the region. The dryness was so severe that it was referred to as the lingering drought. With Addis Ababa in disarray, the geopolitical balance favored Somalia. Hence, Barre seized the opportunity to arm Somali separatists in Ethiopia's Ogadan Plateau. At this point in history, the Somali military had developed into the largest and most advanced force in the region. Eventually, in 1977, emboldened by the circumstances, Somalia launched massive military operations into Ethiopia. Initially, the offense found success. The Somali army controlled about 90% of the Ogadan region and the idea of Greater Somalia was within reach. Then, in a turn of events, somehow the Ethiopian 
Berg managed to convince the Soviets of their Marxist-Leninist devotion. This presented Moscow with the dilemma of backing two allies against one another. At first, the Soviets offered to negotiate a peace settlement, but Barre rejected the idea. Following Mogadishu's refusal, the Soviet Union ceased their support to Somalia and instead started backing Ethiopia, whereas the United States conversely broke with Ethiopia and started supporting Somalia. However, the American support, which accounted to about $100 million annually, was dwarfed by the Soviet commitment. In total, Moscow provided military supplies worth up to $7 billion to Ethiopia. In addition, the Soviet Union sent advisors to the front lines and encouraged Cuba to deploy some 16,000 troops in support of Addis Ababa. The Soviet efforts proved to be decisive. A year later, the Somali army pulled back across the border. The Ogaden War had effectively ceased and Ethiopia was saved from a major defeat. But its civil war continued and would ultimately claim the lives of 1.4 million people. Meanwhile, the Ogaden War had taken an enormous toll on Somalia's military capabilities. About a third of the army had died fighting. Moreover, the economy collapsed and a refugee crisis took hold as ethnic Somalis from their war-stricken Ogaden region fled to Somalia. On top of everything, the lingering drought which began on the eve of the war had resulted in a famine that swept across the Horn of Africa. Regardless of ethnicity and belief, people were starving to death. As Mogadishu's resources and capabilities were stretched thinly, Barre lost credibility and the public sentiment turned against him. In other words, the conditions in Somalia were ripe for civil war. In the 1980s, the situation became critical. Discontent had spread within the military and opposition groups were forming against Barre. As a countermeasure, he became increasingly totalitarian. He could only hold on to power by stamping out his rifles and threats. One such rival was the Ishak clan from the north. Barre sought to weaken the Ishak by resettling Ogadan refugees on their territories. However, his plan backfired when the clan took up arms against him in 1988. In one of his most infamous acts, Barre ordered the bombardment of three main Ishak cities, Hargeisa, Berbera and Burao. Between 50,000 and 100,000 people died. The massacre sent shockwaves throughout the country, and it didn't take long before other clans rebelled as well. Finally, in 1991, Barre fled Mogadishu. However, he left behind a country divided among clans and warlords who all competed to fill the vacuum of power. As violence escalated, state institutions disintegrated. The national army and law enforcement agencies dissolved and the central government collapsed. With no institution left to regain control, Somalia fell into total war. In the following years, the combination of competing clans, refugees and famine led to a massive humanitarian crisis. Highly skilled and well-educated civilians fled the country. As human capital flight peaked, the resources to rebuild state institutions remained out of reach. Gradually, over the years, the lack of a central government enabled the civil war to evolve into a jihadist battle space. Somalia became a safe haven for foreign and regional separatists, jihadists and warlords. In a twist of faith, the country perished under the weight of its own geopolitical ambitions. At the present, political changes are underway in Mogadishu to install a stable government that is sufficiently strong and organized. However, progress has been slow and many obstacles still remain. Take the peacekeeping missions. Despite the presence of 22,000 AU peacekeepers, East African jihadist groups such as Al-Shabaab continue to use Somalia as a launch platform to orchestrate attacks on other nations. In recent years, one of the primary peacekeeping complications has been the lack of stable hosting and funding. Another obstruction is the irredentist initiative that triggered the crisis. Since ethnic Somalis still populate the borderlands of neighboring Kenya and Ethiopia, many foreign powers prefer a stable but a weak government in Mogadishu. 
Meanwhile, the Ishaq-controlled territory has made remarkable progress towards a stable democracy and has proclaimed itself as Somaliland and thus remains out of Mogadishu's reach. One more major obstacle to a stable Somalia is the 4.5 system, which grants autonomy to regional clans. The system is the only structure that survived the civil war. It also allows the central authority to retain political control. Yet, this comes at a cost, as a large portion of the people are denied from participating in the government, while it provides excessive power to some groups. For example, the office of the Speaker of Parliament is reserved for members of the Diril and Mirfla clans, while the presidency is reserved for Darud and Havia members. The 4.5 system is institutionalized in every layer of governmental administration. So, instead of skills and merits, government officials are qualified and selected by their clan allegiances. This form of identity politics contributes to a culture of corruption and poor leadership. Foreign missions in Somalia are left equally perplexed, since the 4.5 system endorses the decentralization of the country into segments, every clan has its own flag, border and president. Meaning, foreign missions in Somalia must open an embassy in the capital, as well as consulates and envoys in various clan-controlled regions. The institutionalized form of identity politics, as well as other security concerns, must be addressed if local disagreements are to be channeled into political expression rather than violence. These are the fundamental requirements for a capable government in Somalia. This was a Caspian report by Michel. Special thanks to our contributors on Patreon who allow Caspian Report to operate independently. And if you want to be part of that progress, see our crowdfunding page on patreon.com slash Caspian Report. In other news, the next report will be produced by Nathan. He is the newest member of Caspian Report and he will explore the history and workings of the African Union. So be sure to check out the next report. In any case, thank you for watching and Sahol.